Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. Today I have a real treat for you. Uh, I want to discuss the work of a gentleman named Wynne Bullock. And Wynne Bullock came to mind uh, mainly because we've been doing a lot of work with color photography lately. Um, we recently did our Developing C41 process episode last week. I've done two shows on that now. And then even as photographers go, we have talked a lot about photo lit of some of the great colorists of the 20th century, some of these early guys. And so we've talked about guys like Fred Herzog, we've talked about Saul Lee. Uh, William Eggleston and you know Wynne Bullock is very interesting because he is really known mainly for this small body of work that really culminated uh, his career in his own artistic development in the early 1960s where he did a series of color abstracts that were all done on Kodachrome slides. And we're going to get to this work in a minute. I want to discuss the entire body of work of Wynne Bullock too. And he fascinates me on a number of levels and Wynne Bullock is somebody, he was born in 1902 and originally was trained as a musician. He was a singer, he was a tenor. Uh, moved to New York, started his career doing Broadway, musical types of stuff, and later moved to Europe. When he was in Europe, he, I think it was specifically when he was in France, started looking at French Impressionism and started falling in love with the work of the Impressionist painters, which inspired him to start making art. Uh, around that time, he bought his first camera and started making images. Uh, later moved back to the United States. Uh, music wasn't working out as a career. He studied law briefly, and you know, what else fails when law's not working out, you become a photographer. But anyway, I say that in kidding. But uh, he uh, had an amazing career, um, had a very successful photography studio that he ran in Southern California. And, but what you see in Bullock's work is this, a person who is a lifelong learner, a person who is a fan of photography, and a person who didn't get his career going until he was probably in his 40s. And what I like about this is we live in a society today, thanks to Hollywood and the music industry back in the 70s and 80s, that we are all trained to celebrate the old legends or the young prodigies, that nothing ever is in between. And what I like about Wynn is this is an individual who comes out and proves that that is not correct, that there is no set time schedule and you can start to develop as an artist, as a person, as an intellectual at any time in your life. And I think that's what I like the most about Wynn is he's, he's, he's mortal in that sense. Now his work is sometimes far from mortal. He's amazing. Um, it was about 1948 when he had a meeting with Edward Weston that changed his life and his career. And Weston influenced him very deeply and you see a lot of that in his work. You also see other Southern California school photographers like Ansel Adams um, that also appear in his work. Now, what I like about it is you can tell a lot, especially with the early work, that Bullock is not doing it to copy somebody or be derivative. It's interesting that, and we're going to look at some of this work in a second, you'll see a lot of these taken as starting points, and then he fuses his own voice in on top of that. So you'll see landscapes that are very in the vein of Ansel Adams, but he's taking them into another direction completely. And I think the same holds true of the influence that he had from Edward Weston. Anyway, without further ado, I think it's time to go look at some work. And uh, so let's head over to the computer and let's check out the work of Wynne Bullock. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the work of Wynne Bullock today. And if you're not familiar with how I normally do this, if you're new to the show, I use Pinterest. And the reason I love Pinterest is because it allows me to bookmark images. It makes it really easy to present in the videos. And if you want to head over and check these out for yourself and look at some of the sources and research further, which I highly recommend you do, it makes it really easy for you to do that. So if you go to Pinterest.com slash Ted Forbes, um, this is my Pinterest account. You can also see stuff that I'm working on that's coming up for future episodes because Obviously, I put them together before I film them. Uh, but anyway, if you go to Pinterest.com slash Ted Forbes, that takes you to my Pinterest boards, and you can scroll through the boards here. And uh, if you go all the way to the bottom, where the new boards tend to live, um, you'll see a board for Win Bullock. And I'm going to go ahead and open that up, and we're going to look at some work today. And as I mentioned, there's several things I really admire about Win Bullock. And, you know, one is you could tell this is a guy that was such an enthusiast and had such a passion for photography and for, he had his heroes that he liked and people he looked up to. And he merged this with this lifelong learning uh, initiative that, of just being a self learner in, you know, regards to physics, philosophy. Um, you know, you're dealing with somebody who, this is pre digital era, so somebody who worked with film and worked very avidly with it and even had patents on several techniques for solarization and density and some things like that. So he was really a pretty interesting and highly intelligent individual. Um, a lot of these 
earlier works that you see in here, you know, like I mentioned, he kind of went unknown for a long period of time in terms of the fine art world. And a lot of these early works, there is a tonality and a sense that you obviously see influences of people like Ansel Adams in here. But what I like about Wynne Bullock is that, you know, using Ansel as kind of a starting place maybe, or maybe some other heroes of his, he kind of did further exploration with the work and took it a step further. So you see a more of a sense of drama than you see in somebody like Ansel Adams, for instance, but you can definitely see that influence being there. Um, you know, these sea palms, I think, are just absolutely beautiful with the way, you know, you have this uh, the, you know, the vapor from the ocean or the fog and the mist coming through, and it really creates a beautiful mood and almost an extra-worldly texture, in a sense. And I really think this is amazing. And, you know, there's some of these two, which obviously echo back to to, you know, the Moonrise uh, piece that Ansel did, I believe in 1941, and these are almost 10 years later. But if you look at where he took these and the sense of drama that comes in these night images, and, you know, Wynn was always somebody who, you know, loved to celebrate the fact that, you know, photography was essentially an art form that dealt with the manipulation of light. And, you know, lots of people have acknowledged that, but you really get a sense of that in these works and the high sense of drama and the work that went into doing these. Um, again, he's almost like, you know, non-earthling photos um, you know the, the high sense of drama um, what light does when it hits the mist when it does at night uh, the way clouds work the way silhouettes work with trees and it's it's some beautiful stuff um, some other work uh, you know I mentioned that when worked very closely with Edward Weston and so you see a lot of you know and I think when referred to this as quote-unquote straight photography um, which was more like dealing with still lives dealing with objects and the way that Wynn would incorporate these is much different, I think, than the way that Weston incorporated them, because you start to see two things. One, again, that high sense of drama, but also exploring these organic forms that come with these. I mean, this is a cross-section of an apple, but it also starts to take on maybe some human forms. Uh, you know, you could see ears in here, maybe a face, eyes, stuff like that. And I think you get more of a sense of this than you do in Weston's work. So I think, once again, you're taking it a step further. And to paraphrase a quote that when Bullock had one time is that he doesn't try, uh, I don't remember what the verbatim quote was, but you know, rather than to approach an object with what he wants it to look like or how he wants to interpret it, but taking the object and letting it speak to him. And I love this with the the um, cross section of a tree here and a woman's hands. And it's almost like you know she may be clenching her waist or something like that, but obviously the waist being a tree here. So you see a sense of metaphor, um, a sense of you know dramatic implication of you know maybe philosophy or something of that nature and you know obviously being tree bark it's a inanimate object but there's a way that you see that kind of flow around this woman's hands and I think that is certainly you know a case where the object is is talking to the artist of what it wants to communicate I know that may seem a little out there and strange but I you know I really think that that's a wildly underrated philosophy for taking photographs that you know some wonderful things come if you learn how to see things and learn what an object is telling you. Another thing that you're going to see a lot in Wynne Bullock's work, which influences the color work that I'm going to get into later, is that I think he had this beautiful taste for abstraction. And obviously creating that with depth of field, um, you know, with motion blur, things of that nature, um, even with a lot of these organic shapes that you see uh, in some cases with these leaves and the cobwebs within them. Uh, and, and you're going to get a sense of how abstraction starts to become a possibility uh, for when you know some of his earliest influences uh, from an art standpoint were impressionist paintings and obviously impressionism uh, deals a great deal with abstraction and reality at the same time and I think that you see that in Wynne's work and not um, you know, so much directly influenced or inspired by Impressionism so much, but I think just the concept of that and how that applies to photography. I don't think he was trying to copy a medium. I think he was letting that breathe and, and speak in a different way. And, you know, even like a lot of these solarization processes, um, you know, you see obviously in the work of people like Man Ray and, you know, a lot of the surrealist era stuff. And, you know, again, there's a layer of abstraction imposed with a layer of reality. And it's just different ways of doing it, whether it's a solarized print or whether it's depth of 
field or something of that nature. Um, another great one is this early image um, that Wynn took. This is a typewriter that's decaying, found object. But again, the infusion of something that is a man-made object, this typewriter, uh, the sense of mortality, um, you know, the fact that it's decaying, it's broken down, it's going to be gone one day. And that mixed with the setting that it's in, where you see some pine leaves and bark in the background. And all of a sudden, these organic shapes start taking it over. And this is a common thing, theme that you see in Wynn's work as well. You know, like we mentioned a minute ago with the hands in the tree, um, you know, this, this super superimposition of, you know, the human quality and its relationship with nature. And I think probably a sense of mortality that comes with this. Another great abstract, and this is a little bit later, I think this is from the 1960s, but this is called the jazz musician. And what we have here is you can sort of make out forms here of, you know, the individual in the center being some kind of musician wearing a suit and probably playing a saxophone, but it starts to distort. So we don't really get a clarity of what's involved with that. But we also see what could possibly be two human forms on either side of this individual. Maybe they're dancing, maybe they're not human, maybe they're spiritual of some kind. And I think, again, this incorporation of abstraction into the subject matter um, really creates a, a viability, a sense of life, and a lot of activity into the composition. I think it's just brilliant and amazing, and these are the things that I really loved about or love about Wynn Bullock. Now, later in life, um, when he hit probably the 1960s, I believe, he started working with these color abstracts, and I want to go through these, because I think these are quite arguably some of the most important pictures um, that have been introduced into the world of color photography. And one thing you have to remember about color photography, and we've talked about the quote-unquote, I refer to them as colors before, people like Eggleston or Saul Leader, and you know, there's others too. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about this is, you know, there, there are many reasons why color photography was not taken seriously. It was not accepted in the fine art world. It was not, uh, you know, just looked at as high art. It was looked at as more, uh, you know, plebeian in a sense, something that the common man does, uh, something of the everyday because, you know, the proliferation of color photography with what people did. I think another issue with this was the archival qualities of early printing processes for color just wasn't up to par. And so it was really difficult to get archival quality prints made of these. And most of these photographers, the work that you see now is scans from the original negatives. And that is the case here with Wynn Bullock also, is that these are scans that his family later did, or his estate did after his passing. And these were all done with Kodachrome, and so you have the brilliant colors that come up. But what's really interesting to me is these rival, uh, you know, I think sometimes beyond abstract expressionism, I think they're way ahead of their time. I, these are the kind of abstracts that, looking at these, you would expect to see today, not in 1974 when he died or earlier in the 60s um, and I think there's a real sense of beauty that comes with these I love the fact that they're completely abstract you don't know or have a sense of what these are the best I could do in my research and looking at these um, you know you can tell that some of these forms are probably color and light shot through something that's going to diffuse the light and abstract it so this could be either um, you know highly formed glass maybe ice something of that nature um, there are also techniques in here using motion blur um, lots of depth of field and it's also been said that he layered these and I'm not real sure what that means exactly whether they were double exposures or multiple exposures or what the the situation was but definitely what you do is you see this this play with light and I think that you know I'll, another quote that Wynn had that I'm probably going to botch here but mis misphrase but but the sense of light being I think he said the the ultimate truth and if you're looking for truth in photography I think he found this in these abstracts and I think there's an emotional play that you get from seeing these I know not everybody likes abstract work um, you start to try to interpret it differently I do like abstract work and I think these are just utterly beautiful the way the shape, the form, the motion, um, the flow of these. Uh, sometimes there's cloud-like textures. Sometimes there are mist-like textures that harken all the way back to some of these earlier works of landscapes. And, you know, as we mentioned before, even some of these depth of field oriented shots or, you know, the blur that you saw with the jazz musician. And so a lot of these techniques being incorporated into shooting with Kodachrome and going completely abstract. And I think this is just simply amazing. Now, these were done um, early 60s, I believe, 
And he reverted back to black and white photography after that. And I think that's why I wanted to make the point of, you know, when you're looking at some of these color works, why they weren't known at that time, why it's been only more recently that they've come out. And it's really interesting because I think in some ways, maybe color photography was a little bit of ahead of its time in terms of archival quality, um, you know, things of that nature. And it just was not something that was embraced and accepted by fine art world or the photography world. And we're just now starting to get treated to a lot of these works. You know, we've talked about um, Fred Herzog. We've talked about Saul Leader on here. We've talked about William Eggleston. And Eggleston was one of the pioneers who actually started cramming it through a little bit. He actually had the solo show at MoMA. And uh, anyway, I, I just think this work is brilliant. It's amazing. And it's kind of like, where has this been? This is some important work that I believe has gone missing for quite some time. So anyway, um, go subscribe to Pinterest and uh, go check out my boards on here and go research these images further. When you click on the image, it'll take you to the source where I found it and you're going to find some other images as well on here and there is a world of beautiful work with Wynne Bullock who uh, you know I think is never really had his his due justice he's um, deserving of much more uh, fame and popularity than he has ever experienced but that is the work of Wynne Bullock. So that is the work of Wynne Bullock, and I don't think I can say enough how I feel that he is a photographer who has not had the fame and notoriety and legend status that I believe that he deserves. And you can see that clearly demonstrated in these images. Um, I think it's interesting that he had this large body of work, um, made his living as a photographer. He was well known at the time. I mean, he was included in, in Schecken's Family of Man exhibition. Um, but at the same time, he kind of went forgotten for a number of years and the estate recently did the scans of the Kodachrome images and you know we didn't have the technology at the time for an archival definitive process for a lot of printing techniques early on and you know that and a number of other reasons why color photography was not celebrated as fine art photography so in the last 10, 20 years, we've had a lot of this influx of stuff, it's the missing link kinds of stuff. Um, the the Saul Leader work that was largely ignored for years that went undetected. Um, you know, and I think that, that Wynn Bullock certainly is deserving and falls into that category as well. Um, and anyway, another great interesting photographer, another of the Southern California school. It's funny how all these things are tying in lately. I think a lot of it's my experience. You know, we've been talking about color photography. Um, I was recently in Southern California and did an episode on Schulman. And and anyway, I just think he's he's definitely worth checking out. So what I would do is is you know get on the internet and look at more. Um, go over to the Pinterest board, use that as a starting point. Go check out some of the links some of those photos came from uh, that I selected, and look at more work. I think you're going to find a world of beauty and amazement within Win Bullock, and also to research him as a person. He was quite interesting. There's a lot of famous quotes that Win has. And anyway, all this to say. That is the work of Wynne Bullock, and once again, this has been another episode of The Art of Photography. I will see you guys next week. Later.